Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, our guest is Amanda Hahn. Thanks for being on the show, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me here, Whitney. Amanda is the author of the best-selling book, Tax Strategies for the Savvy Real Estate Investor, and the new book called Advanced Tax Strategies, re releasing February the 20th, 2020. She's also a CPA specializing in tax saving strategies for real estate investors and real estate professionals in various asset classes across multiple states. She's a frequent speaker and educator in real estate related topics for entity structuring and self-directed investing. So Amanda, thank you again for your time. Your, your specialty is so needed by myself and, and everyone else I know listening to the show. So we're grateful to have you on. Tell the listeners a little more about who you are, maybe where you're located and, and let's jump in. Yeah, sure, sure. So um, in addition to just being a, you know, a, a kind of a boring CPA, uh, I'm also an investor myself as well. So my husband and I, uh, we started investing in real estate uh, several years ago. Uh, and in fact, I'm a third generation of real estate investors in my family. So my grandparents invest in real estate, my parents invest in real estate. And we happened to get into real estate um, because we were, uh, my husband and I were working for one of the big four accounting firms uh, in the real estate group and, you know, doing taxes for, for rich people and came to the realization that these people pay no taxes, even though they make so much money. So kind of how we got started and uh, been fortunate to kind of combine our passion for tax strategies, but also be able to, uh, what I, I learned from my clients on what they're doing in real estate, how they're making money and try to implement that for ourselves as well. That's so interesting. And that, that was somewhat of a realization I had uh, in, it was like 2009, but, but I, I had never been exposed to real estate before. And then it hit me. I was reading Rich Dad Poor Dad, amongst other books, and it Same was like, here. "Wow, you know, wait a minute. Well, how did I not know about this? You know." Uh, and so it, it's incredible though. you get to see how so many people have built wealth and you get to use those same strategies and help strategize as well with your expertise. Yeah. But, you know, one thing, you know, we were going to talk about and you and I briefly discussed it before the show. And, and I get this question all the time about how, how I should be structured and how this uh, hurts or how this hurts or helps my, my taxes or does it. And, you know, mm -hmm. as far as being an operator in deals and I'd love to talk about, um, you know, as far as a passive investor as well. Uh, but maybe as an operator, you know, you could help us think through like, you know, do we need 12 different entities? And, and, you know, is this something that's good for our taxes or something you recommend and things like that? Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know, get us started and I'm sure I'll have some questions. Sure. That's a great question. I think, uh, you know, the answer often is it depends, right? With anything right. In, in taxes, unfortunately. But um, as a general guideline, if you are an operator or, you know, a syndicator yourself, um, typically what we recommend are two different structures. Uh, one is going to be the syndication, which is where all the investors are. Uh, so you have all of your limited partners and you might be one of the limited partners too, right? If you're putting money in and that's that entity will flow up, you know, cash flow, appreciation and all the passive income that we really like uh, in addition to write-offs and depreciation. But for most syndicators, we also earn active income. Uh, so, it, you know, that's generally defined as acquisition fee income, asset management fee, disposition fee, uh, all those things that you're, you know, working as a syndicator. Um, typically, we recommend that uh, that entity often referred to as the GP entity. Uh, we generally recommend that to be another kind of entity, depending on how much money you're making, uh, that oftentimes is going to be some kind of a corporation, uh, like an S-corp. And the reason for that is to help you minimize self-employment tax. So, you know, as an example, if you're a syndicator and this year you got acquisition fee of $100,000, let's say, if you earn that in an S-corporation, it could help you to save up to six, $7,000 worth of taxes in just that one year. So it definitely could make sense. Um, but I think going back to your question, you know, how many entities, uh, I, you know, every CPA has a different school of thought on that. I think for me, um, at least from the tax perspective, the fewer the entities, the better it is. Um, because there's no need for you to pay an attorney, a CPA to do tax returns unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, at least that's, you know, <laughs> 
That's yes. my opinion, at least. Yes. Uh, so if you're a sponsor and you're syndicating a couple different deals, maybe you have that same GP entity and that could be used for multiple syndications that you're involved in. Or if you have an LLC that holds your own rental property as well as syndicated deals, that LLC could be holding you know, multiple syndication investments as well. So um, of course, everyone's unique uh, situation is going to be unique, but generally speaking, that's how I typically like to see the structure. Okay. So, so now let's talk about uh, the, the specific uh, operator, like, like his, yeah. his personal, um, you know, ownership in that property. Right. And then, you know, and yes, he may be investing passively as well. Uh, but, but let's say, you know, you're the operator, you have equity in this property. How should I own, you know, how should I hold that equity? Mm -hmm. I, so I've been told, you know, I should have this holding company over here. I should have a separate mm -hmm. entity. That's just say my wife and I, you know, and that, that sure. has our, we'll say our, our active investment holdings, you know, and, and, and then, you know, some, and then maybe a separate one for passive holdings, you yeah. know, but I, I yeah. just yeah. would love your opinion. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, a uh, big picture, we generally want active and passive in two different entities. So, okay. so yes, you might have, you know, if I'm investing in your syndication, I could either just invest as Amanda Han or I can invest as Amanda Han LLC, um, purely from a tax perspective, it makes no difference either way. Okay. I'm still going to get the write-off. I'm still, if it's a multifamily and it has depreciation, I'm still going to get the depreciation, whether I hold it individually or if I hold it in another LLC. Um, so, so in other words, the only reason to hold it inside your own LLC would be for asset protection purposes. Um, and then that unfortunately is not something that I should comment on because I'm not an attorney. If you get sued, you wouldn't call me. Um, but you know, I think some attorneys recommend having Having a different LLC. Other attorneys will say, you know, the as a passive investor in a syndication, your risk of being sued is fairly small. So maybe you don't need to, you know, have the cost to form yet another entity. Um, so, so from a structuring perspective, yeah, if I'm investing in the, you know, passively, I think for me, I can do it individually or I can have my own LLC do it. But if I'm investing in three different syndications, I probably wouldn't have three LLCs. I probably just have one LLC, you know, let's call it Amanda Hahn LLC. And that LLC will be the owner of all, all of my equity investment in the three syndications. So it helps to kind of, you know, keep things simple, if you will. Yeah. Um, but on the active side, yeah, you definitely, you know, it's, it's not going to be Amanda Han LLC where my rentals are. It's going to be something completely different. It's not going to own any real estate. It's just going to be kind of my cash machine where I get all of my fees and acquisition income and all that good stuff. Okay. So the operator would have an uh, entity that that's, that's really his personal entity that owns his ownership in that property. And that's exactly. where that's where his acquisition fee and those things like you were talking about any kind of fees are going to go in flow into. Uh, so so there'll be a one entity where so you know, as a syndicator in my in my example I wear two hats right I am an investor I'm a right. limited partner investor I am also a general partner where I'm actively involved right my ownership in those two will be in different entities so right right yeah, and, and I guess be, uh, mm -hmm. you know in the deal structure itself yeah there may be numerous entities but I guess I just mean like for the personal operator's portfolio himself, yeah. you know, the, the part of those entities that he owns, I just wondered if that should be owned by an entity that, that he has, that's just his. I mean, you could, but it would be two different entities. So when you often right. hear attorneys talk about like a holding company, mm -hmm. um, so holding company could make sense if, you know, the parent is the holding company and underneath that I have a bunch of different real estate, like, you know, rental property, number one, apartment, number two, syndication, number three, that can all roll up to the holding company. But my acquisition fee is not going to go into any of those LLCs or that holding company. I would just have another entity called, um, you know, Amanda, the manager, LLC. And that's where all my active income goes to. So yeah, that would just be completely unrelated to where my real estate is. And it's just a quirky thing, you know, that for active income, we want that to be in an S corporation usually versus for rental income. We generally don't want that to be an S corp. That's why they're, you know, I, I typically like to say it's left hand and right hand. My left hand is all my rental income and cash flow. My right hand is all the active income that I'm working towards. Okay. That's good to know. Active income in an S corp, but any passive income just in an LLC. Yep. You got it. You okay. Got so it. what, you know, what about, um, you know, different, in, different LLCs as if I'm that active investor and, and, you know, we're doing numerous deals. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I have, you know, my entity, you know, whatever I want to call it, WS real estate, whatever active. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and we do a deal here. Okay. Now, you know, that deals, 
you know, acquisition fee and any kind of fees are flowing through, you know, WS real estate, whatever. And then, you know, active, and then we do another deal over here, mm -hmm. you know, should that also, you know, would you suggest having a different entity for that, for this new large property or? No, anything? not unless you need to. So yeah, if it's just, you know, if Whitney is the only, you know, if you're the, the only person actively involved, um, then yeah, it would just be with a one in the same LLC. So you would have your, um, you know, let's say we'll call it Whitney acquisitions LLC, right? That's your active income. That could be the GP in multiple deals, right? And it could get paid syndication fees from multiple sources of revenue. Um, we like that because for tax purposes, it's all the same income, right? Whether you got an acquisition right. fee for Main Street property or Fremont Street, it's all just acquisition fee. And, and when, we ha when we start having these multiple S corps, more tax returns, more legal fees, more payroll, more retirement account you got to set up, more bank accounts. And so the really the goals try to get the most tax saving, but with the fewest number of entities whenever possible. Uh, there are times when, you know, the operators have to have different entities for different deals. I typically see that occur when you're partnering with different people, right? So it's Whitney, John, and James here, but it's Whitney, Beth, and Mary, and the other one. So in those instances, okay, maybe we're talking about two different GPs because there's just different people involved on the active side. So what about, you know, uh, series entities versus just, you know, and I've heard, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, I, I want a different entity for every deal, you know, yeah. and, and, and when I say every deal, I mean like hundred plus unit deals. And so, yeah. you know, and, and on, you know, personally, so they're going to have a different entity for every deal. And I understand yeah. on the structure of these, of the syndication, we're going to have different entities obviously for every deal, but I just mean sure. me personally to hold yeah. my active ownership, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. would you recommend uh, a different entity or I know we just said probably not, but, mm -hmm. but what about using a series or, or not? Yeah. Um, so in the, on the rental income side, right, the passive rental income that we're getting, whether you hold it individually or through an LLC or a series of LLCs, the tax treatment is exactly the same. So same write-off, same depreciation. There's no okay. difference at all. And so the only reason to have multiple entities, like in a series, for example, is to have better asset protection. Right. And some attorneys really like series LLCs. Other attorneys really, you know, don't really like it. I think it also depends. Uh, another point of consideration is where are the properties located and where are you located? Um, so I'm in California. For example, California has a crazy rule that says every single LLC that's ultimately owned by you as a resident has to pay $800 fees every year to the state, even, even mm -hmm. though you might have a loss on your tax return. So you can imagine if I have five babies plus a parent, that's six times $800 every single year. Um, they have similar rules for you know, New York, not as high of a fee. So, uh, you know, versus places like Texas or Tennessee, there is no income tax, you know, not a lot of fees, then maybe it's a good idea to do one of those series structures. So, and that's why it's important to make sure, you know, when you're talking about entity setup, you're talking to your CPA, you're talking to your attorney, and you really understand what's the cost. Because uh, I think people hear initially and say, wow, I love that series, everything's separated, it's so safe. Uh, but if you get a four or $5,000 bill every year, it's like, okay, well, maybe does that make sense for me, right? right? <laughs> okay, so here's the simple truth. If you don't have private investors waiting on the sidelines right now, you're going to have a hard time closing your next syndication. Are you afraid to talk to investors? Do you feel you have a lack of credibility or no one will take you seriously? Or what about your systems? Do you have anything set up yet? Well, if you know you can improve on getting in front of and influencing passive investors, then you should call my friend Adam Adams. Adam has a proven system for you to flip the script. Now, this, this is a five-figure investment for you to take your business to the next level. I want to see you succeed, so I placed a link in the show notes for you to apply to work with the Adam Adams. And if you think you qualify and you know you're going to take action on what he teaches you, then scroll down, find the link, and take your money-raising abilities to the next level. So now for the, the passive investor, I know you mentioned this a little bit, but I thought we'd, we would reiterate it that, you know, is, is it, is it needed for them to have an entity that they're investing through? We, you know, we have many investors that invest through entities and many just through their personal name. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, from a tax perspective, again, it's not required. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say that you invest in the syndication. Um, you know, before you invested, you went to visit the property. So you had some flight costs, hotel costs, maybe you're really nice. You took the syndicator out to dinner to find out more about this investment. So the quite common question we get is, well, can I deduct those if I don't have an entity? And the answer is yes. You don't need a legal entity to deduct those expenses against your passive income. So, um, you know, for the most part, if you're just passively investing in syndications, at least from the tax perspective, there's not a need to have an LLC for that. Um, of course, you know, the other side of the coin is it doesn't hurt, right? If your attorney's like, well, I don't know, might not be a bad idea for you to just have one just to get more asset protection. That's okay too, right? And then the, from that perspective, it's just, okay, what's the cost? Legal, tax, accounting, state fee, and does that make sense for the additional protection I'm getting, right? And I think the answer will be you know, different from investor to investor. Sure, sure. <laughs> What about different, you mentioned, you know, about different states and different, yeah. you know, fees and things like that. Well, you know, what about, you know, a lot of people are doing like Wyoming entities or LLCs yeah. and Delaware yeah. and things like that. And, and, you know, I think they can do series entities there, you know, sure. and, and, and somewhat kind of be under the radar. I think for a while, you know, they, they, you couldn't find the owner's name. I'm not, I've heard that maybe that's changed now, but, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, what about what state it's in? You know, if I have an entity in Wyoming, but I live in Virginia and we're buying mm -hmm. property in the West somewhere, you know, do, does that yeah. matter as far as our taxes are concerned? Yeah, good question. So tax wise, and this is a common misconception, people feel like, okay, maybe I live in California, I'm investing in Tennessee and New York and Florida, I, that means I got to have three LLCs. Uh, and that's not the case at all. So so if your attorney says, I really like Wyoming for asset protection purposes, uh, what they'll do is they'll form a Wyoming entity. That entity then will register in your home state. So if I live in California, it will be a Wyoming entity registering in California. If I happen to buy a Texas property, I will likely register in Texas this year, file a franchise report, which, you know, generally you don't owe any taxes. And then next year or, you know, later on, I invest in Arizona or New Mexico, then I'll register that same LLC to do business in these other states. So um, not really a problem from the tax perspective if you have one entity operating in multiple, step, uh, multiple states. Um, the downside, of course, is, you know, when you get into multiple states, um, there are likely going to be state tax returns that the state wants you to file, right? So, um, you know, I tell people in the stock market, people talk about diversity, right? I want to diversify into large cap and small cap. In real estate, uh, maybe we don't want to diversify into 10 different states or 20 different states when you're just starting out, because you can imagine, you know, you have one single family here, one single family there. And before you know it, you have like a 200 page tax return. <laughs> That's what you're trying to avoid. Yes. See, and this may be a, a similar question, but, uh, but slightly different it is, you know, what about that, that passive investor? And, and I've received this question and I just want to make sure I'm saying it correctly. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, they say, well, you know, I live in Maine, but I'm investing in your property, you know, in Utah, you know, what taxes am I paying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So generally speaking, uh, you know, you'll pay tax if there's profit, okay, on that real estate, you'll pay taxes in Maine, and then you'll pay taxes in Utah, uh, assuming there's, there's profit. Oftentimes, the states will give you a credit. So meaning, okay, Maine knows you pay tax in Utah, they might give you a credit, so you're not double taxed. Um, but that arrangement is state specific, so between one state and another state, uh, although more and more states are doing that. Um, the reality of it is, though, um, I think most of uh, investors know, right, is that the goal with investments in real estate is we want cash flow and appreciation, but we won't have taxable income. Because we'll have depreciation, we'll have a lot of write-offs. So, you know, in your example, someone living in Maine, investing in Utah, sure, you might have to fall in Utah, but likely it's going to be a loss anyway, which means you're just filing a return. You're not really paying taxes in Utah because that syndication is going to have a lot of depreciation that you can take it, you know, take a deduction for. Right? Will, will our common CPA know that, that, they, that we also need to file taxes in another state like that? <laughs> oh, that's a tough question. I don't know. I can't comment for a common CPA because well, I, I just so, like there's uh -huh. you know there's C, I mean there's specialty state CPAs that specialize it seems and you know yeah. the, say the W two employee versus somebody that's real estate you know or right, right. Um, you know and I, I mean no offense at all to any CPA but but yeah. uh, but there's different specialties right 
And, yeah. and so, yeah. so I just wonder, you know, I was just thinking about the, the passive investor who has a CPA, he's had a, you know, the investors had a, say a W2 high income earner for a long time. Sure. CPA has been amazing, but all of a sudden he's investing in a property many states away. You just yeah. wondered if there was anything that might come up that, that, you know, they may sure. not catch or know of. And we do see that um, uh, frequently, you know, when I review someone's return and I'll ask, hey, how come you didn't file in Ohio or Ohio cities? You know, like we have all these properties that not just the state return, but city returns or district returns that they want. Um, so sure. I think if, you know, if you just go to like, um, you know, kind of a, what we consider like a turn and burn shop that just does W-2 stay in and day out. Yeah, odds are they're just filing in your home state because they don't know that there's a need to file in the other states or or that there's a benefit to filing. And, you know, because we said, okay, well, if there's a loss, why do we file? Well, because we want to capture the loss so we can use it in the future. Um, so yeah, it, that's it's highly possible that's something they don't know. I think when you're you're talking to your CPA, especially if you're new to investing in real estate, uh, you want to find out from your tax person, you know, how well versed they are in real estate. You know, have they dealt with K-1s from syndications? You know, what do they understand depreciation? How many real estate investor clients do they have? Because uh, you don't want to be the only, you know, <laughs> or the right. one of the few clients that they're doing. Uh, you just never want to be someone's test case. So, yeah, I would definitely ask that question if there's a, a significant change going strictly from, you know, W-2 to now investing in real estate. Great. All right, Amanda, well, just a, a few more questions before we run out of time. Uh, but, you know, what's been the hardest part of this, the real estate investing journey for you? The hardest part, gosh, uh, you know, I think for me, um, finding the right deals. Uh, I started real estate uh, back when the market was uh, really depressed. And so I think like a lot of our clients, you know, it's like found really great deals and um, not being able to replicate, you know, something on that level. But I think it's, you know, it's different. It's just always trying to uh, find the deals that work for you. Something that was difficult when I first started out was learning how to look at a deal for the deal itself and not falling in love with the the project or the ideal or the property right like oh i love this property because of the walk-in bathroom and and then maybe i'll retire here or i love that syndicator uh because he's so nice and he's just starting out but oops he lost all my money because he's just starting out so things like that just really analyzing things for what they are um i think for you know over the years that's kind of hard lesson learned for me is you know looking at the deal for the deal and doing due diligence on the syndicator uh even more so than the property if you're looking at a past Sure. investment. For sure. Great advice. Um, so how do you prepare for this potential downturn that everyone's talking about? Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, um, we've sold a lot of our California properties already. Um, you know, just for anyone who's, you know, in California kind of has already seen the, a lot of the changes in the state and, and things like that. Um, but I just, I think education, you know, learning more about different products. And um, I'm a, a big fan of, uh, you know, analyzing the economics of things. So I like learning about what the millennials are doing, what the boomers are doing. I think it helps to guide me in terms of what kind of product will be easier um, for cash flow, for appreciation and things like that. So yeah, I think just continuous learning <laughs> so that you're prepared when the time comes, you can jump on all the deals. Nice. What's a way you have recently improved your business that we could apply to ours? Uh, recently improved to my CPA business or for my real estate business? Either one. Oh, gosh. Um, you know, my CPA business, we're always trying to improve on things. And I think it's the same for our real estate. I am a strong believer of focusing on what you do well and cutting out the things that you're just mediocre at or maybe not the, you know, uh, world-class app. So uh, in our CPA business, we, we used to do, you know, bookkeeping, payroll, tax returns and all that. And now we're heavily focused on tax planning because that's what we're good at. That's what we know how to do. Um, and then for, you know, the bookkeeping, the, the daily journal entry kind of things, we just kind of refer out uh, because we, you know, there's not much value we're adding so that everyone here can focus on where we bring the most value. Um, I think that same concept applies to our real estate too. It's just, you know, understanding, uh, you know, because my husband and I were both still working uh, in the practice. So we, we are not out there negotiating deals or doing flips, you know, in the middle of the night. And so just really knowing what we're good at, uh, what our limitations are, and then building a real estate portfolio around, you know, those things. 
So as a, you know, as a passive investor, so I like asking operators when they're on the show, you know, how, how they stand out in their relationship with their investors, okay. you know, what, what makes them different or stand out. And so, you know, on your side as a passive investor, you know, is there anything that, you know, that's really made an operator stand out to you that says, okay, you know, I, I really like this operator. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, you know, <laughs> I, uh, because we do taxes, I see the number side of things. Uh, and for me, uh, it's very important. I feel like the way they handle uh, the finances, you know, how organized they are, how good they are in their projections, that tells me a lot about their ability to deliver on what the promises are. But I think for most passive investors, they might not get that kind of insight, you know, into um, right. uh, into what it is. So I think uh, if I didn't have that insight, I would say, you know, look at their experience, um, look at what deals they've done in the past, talk to other people who've invested with them. Uh, and something really easy, you know, just search their name and fraud and SEC and complaints, right? Because that's what we're looking for. And if we don't find right. anything, great. But if we do, those are big red flag items. Um, we have clients who, you know, syndicated deals that um, they didn't make a whole lot of money on their end, but that was because they changed things around to make sure the investors were taken care of. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think those kinds of things stand out in my mind is that uh, sure. they have their eye on the longer term goal is I make my investors happy so they will come back and again and again, rather than, you know, paying myself first and then maybe they'll never come back again <laughs> right for sure what's the number one thing that's contributed to your success the number one thing oh my gosh I don't know. I think taking action. Uh, I'm a big believer of taking action, whether it's, you know, getting into your first deal or doing your first syndication. Um, I know it's scary for a lot of people and myself included, but yeah, taking action. Um, you know, when we set out to, to write a tax book a couple of years ago, uh, I, it's something I wanted to do for a long time. And then one day I was on a cruise and I just said, you know, I have no internet here. Um, <laughs> I have nothing to do. So start. And so I think, you know, taking that first step is a uh, key to, you know, any kind of success. Well, b- besides being on the show today and maybe your book, how do you like to give back? Um, so my husband and I have a, we formed a nonprofit uh, organization uh, several years ago. It's called Animals for Armed Forces. And what we do is uh, we raise money uh, in which the money will go towards um, paying for donate, uh, paying for adoption fees. So if you're someone who is a member of the armed forces, current or retired, and you want to adopt a shelter animal, uh, our organization helps to pay for the adoption fee and vaccination and things like that. So we're big animal lovers and, um, you know, it was just something we wanted to do to, to kind of entice other people to uh, adopt right, and take a pet home. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you for giving back in that way, Amanda, you and your husband. Thank you for your time today. I know I've enjoyed the show. I've learned a lot from you just today. I know the listeners have as well, but tell them how they can get in touch with you and also find your book. Yeah. Uh, so the best way to get in touch is uh, our website. Uh, there's a lot of great free information. That's www.keystonecpa.com. Um, and yes, so we had a, we wrote a book on tax strategies for the savvy real estate investor, which could be found on uh, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, Bigger Pockets, and our new book, uh, The Advanced Tax Strategies, uh, comes out February 20th. And uh, don't let the name scare you. It says advanced strategies, uh, but it's all lots of stories. Um, Um, around real estate tax strategies, what went well, what went bad. And if we have anyone, you know, who is a full-time W-2 worker, want to know how to use real estate to reduce taxes or, you know, for wealth planning in general, we have a whole chapter specifically about people who are just investing passively on the side. So check those out. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show, brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.